I, I am so competitive that I take this spirit of competition into the grocery store. Anybody with me on this? Like, I'm so competitive that I'll, I'll scan all of the lines at the grocery store and figure out which line is gonna get me out the fastest and the first. Anybody with me on this? Like, intuitively, like, we know that there are certain grocery lines that, like, hey, this cashier, she's gonna be talkative, so, like, we're gonna avoid this one like the plague. Like, you can just see it in her eyes. She's probably gonna ask you what you're cooking with all of the food, and ain't nobody got time for that, okay? I'm so competitive at the grocery store that I will get in one line physically, and then I will put myself mentally in a completely other line to see which one of me finishes the lines first. I know it's a sick thing. I, I realize that, and, and I'm in therapy about that and many other things. But I'm competitive. But the competition at the grocery store doesn't stop at the grocery store. Men, you're going to be with me on this, because if our wives send us to the grocery then it is another competition once we get home to see how many bags we can carry in at one time. Are you with me, men? Come on, somebody help me out. I I don't care if it cuts off the circulation. I don't care if the plastic bag handles start to cut into layers of epidermis in my skin. It doesn't matter if I pull a hammy. I'm in it to win it, and we're, we're leaving it all on the field, okay? Uh, I'm so competitive that like 95% of the time I can get all of the groceries in one trip, right? This is impressive. Y'all are impressed. Y'all thought I was a great pastor. Wait till you see me carry groceries in. My wife will ask me in the moment like, hey, Brandon, you need a hand? And of course I do because I I can't logically get all of it in one trip, let alone two trips. Probably it's going to take three or four trips. But like most men, my response in the moment is, eh, I got it. There's 412 pounds of groceries in my trunk. Of course I need help, but it's the competitive nature. It's what we as men do as we're trying to carry in. We overload ourselves with all of these groceries, but it's It's not just the men that do this with groceries. It's all of us that do this in life. We take on so much more than we can handle. We overload our lives and overload our schedules and overload our calendars and activities to the point where it's completely and utterly overwhelming. The reality is in our life, we are doing way too much against the capacity that we have to do it. We're overloading our lives emotionally, physically, mentally to the point that it is now in our culture and on social media in vogue to be completely overloaded, right? There's the hashtag soccer mom because we've taken our kids to eight different sporting events. They've got seven different musicals they've got to attend. We all as a family have to be in six different places all at one time. And there are so many different types of overload that we in our society, in our day, right now, today, in our families and in our lives, we overload ourselves. A few of those overloads, if you're taking notes, we're we're activity overloaded. We are the busiest generation in the world. We've actually created technology that is supposed to help with efficiency so that we can get margin in our lives, but it's actually created less margin than we've ever had in our lives. We've got more emails coming in, more text messages, more notifications. They're they're constantly filling our schedules. And there's this expectation that as we're busy, we're still instantly connected and instantly responding. Growing up, I I remember if I wanted to get in touch with a friend, I would have to go home into the kitchen where the phone was hanging on the wall, right? And I would have to call my friend and and, and if I wanted to spend some time with him, get on the house phone, dial their phone number and hope that they picked up. And oftentimes it would ring six or seven times and I'm like, oh, they're not home, they're away. I don't know where they're at, but 
They're not there. If they were a family that was well off, then they would have an answering machine. And then I could say, hey, so-and-so, call me back. I, I, I want to hang out this weekend. And then I just wouldn't hear from them for a few days. And that was normal and that was fine. And yet today, if we send a text, there's this expectation that within several minutes, we expect to hear back. If we don't hear back from them, we start to think, oh, does this person hate me? Is it over? Are they dead? What's going on? What's wrong? There's activity overload in our life, but there's also choice, and I'm sorry, change overload. There's change overload because we have in our generation the highest levels of change in any generation in history. Breaking news today is old news tomorrow. We have change overload. Most generations before us never moved 100 miles away from where they were born, and yet our kids have lived in three different states, and our daughter's about to turn 13. There's change overload. There's choice overload. We have way, way, way too many choices that are overloading our lives and, and our minds and our hearts to the point that sociologists have now uh, said and diagnosed that we have in our culture a paralysis of choice. My wife sends me to the grocery store to get tomato sauce. Do you know how complex of a request that is? Just walking into the grocery store, there's 114 different types of tomato sauce that you can get. You've got the organic, you've got the normal, you've got the grass-fed, you've got the whatever it is, and there are so many choices. You go to the store to get headache medicine. Do you want long-lasting or fast action? Do you, what do you need? There's so many choices. If you're in the dating scene, you can date one of 80 million people who are online today. It used to be back in the day, you just find someone in your hometown who you're not related to. <laughs> right? In the state of Alabama, it doesn't even matter if you're related to them, I guess, but... Uh, we are, uh, we're overloaded with choices. There's a commitment overload. We're part of too many different things. Our kids are in five different clubs with eight different sports teams at 14 different events. We drive them here. We drive them there. We drive them everywhere. There's debt overload. We've got more debt than any generation in human history. It's estimated that the American debt load across the United States is $17.5 trillion. To put that into perspective, the average American carries almost $8,000 of consumer debt every single month. To drill down further into that, the average American spends more than 10% of their income every single month paying off consumer debt. Credit card debt in the last quarter swelled by almost 20%. We are so busy. We're so overloaded, and the reality is we're here, we're there, we're everywhere, we're distracted, we're preoccupied, we can't focus on the task in front of us, we struggle to follow through with what we have been presented with, we don't keep our commitments, and this hurry and this busy in our lives means we're so inundated, but yet it's so normal in our society that today, psychologists and mental health professionals are now talking about an epidemic in the modern world that they have termed hurry sickness. It's this behavior pattern categorized by continual rushing and anxiousness. Now, maybe you wouldn't identify yourself in this category, but maybe you've felt it. Maybe you've seen this tension, this pressure in our culture, and here's what I know. This constant busy, this incessant hurry can be crushing, and it is certainly not the way Jesus intended life to be. Dallas Willard says that hurry is the great enemy of our spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And yet, we can get so busy and so focused on all of the collateral around us that we miss what God wants to do in us. And because of what Jesus has to say about life and rhythm and busy and hurry, I think in this season, more than ever, we have got to tune in to his truth and his life. So 
Let's grab our Bibles, turn over to Luke chapter 10, where we find the closest thing that Jesus gave to a sermon on busyness. Now, this sermon that Jesus gave in Luke chapter 10 is only about one paragraph long. It's a a paragraph that uh, Jesus only has about two sentences where he's going to say some things. Maybe it's because busy people can't handle long sermons, but in any event, uh, this segment of Scripture was such a timely message for these people, and it's a timely message for us. So Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Martha had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which it will not be taken from her. Here we are, Jesus comes to town and he goes to Mary and Martha's house, friends of Jesus. And no matter how many times I read this story, I always empathize with Martha because she's running around making sure everything is picked up, making sure everything's put away in order for Jesus To show up, imagine just the scene, like Jesus comes into town, there was no no ETA sharing, there was no text, hey, I'm on my way, I'll be there in 15. Jesus just shows up and Mary and Martha are there. And if you're anything like our family, our family, we're raising two kids that have our last name and that eat all of our groceries. And as we're raising our kids, they just seem to leave their toys and their stuff and their everything everywhere around the house. So let's say Jesus comes to my house. I'm not saying like we're so OCD that we vacuum ourselves into bed every night. No, yet we're not on the other end of the spectrum where like everything is a complete dumpster fire around our house. We've got a happy medium in between. But if Jesus shows up, there's some work that's got to be done. There are some things that have got to be picked up, which is where Mary and Martha are at in the story. And Martha, I so resonate with her because there's a part of me that wants to step in and protest a bit, uh, stand up to, to say, Jesus, how could you encourage such a responsibility? Like, yes, there's a time for teaching. Yes, there's a time for learning, but this is not the time. The house is gonna be a mess. Nobody's gonna eat around here if you just let everyone worship and pray and sit at your feet instead of helping me out. Of course, I don't usually make those type of thoughts public, but Martha did. Maybe, maybe you're with me. Maybe you resonate with Martha here. Like, Jesus, you're just not being very realistic. Somebody's got to get this stuff done. This house isn't clean in itself. Can't be reading books and listening to sermons all day. I'm even a pastor, and I, I can't do that. I have a family. My family needs me, our, our church, our community, our friends. They expect me to stay on top of things. Mary's style may work for a monk or like a personal retreat day, but her little time out just isn't a doable, practical way of life. Besides, on the other hand, Martha was doing important things. It's not like she was glued to her phone watching TikTok or YouTube. She was serving just like the Bible tells us to do. And this is how Martha feels, and maybe it's how you have felt at certain times. Many of us probably can relate. Like there's just, there's no time to slow down. There's no time to sit and rest. There's no time to refuel and refresh. Like you've just got to keep going all the time or you'll get left behind. Like there's this idea that you got to keep working to pay the rent. You got to keep job hunting so that you can put food on the table. You've got to keep taking your kids to every music lesson, every sports practice, every dance rehearsal so that they don't fall behind with the rest of the other kids. You, you've got to keep going on dates so that you can write, find the right person to go with. Like you've just got to keep going and keep busy so that you don't fall behind. This life of go, 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 run, run, run is so normal in our society. 
But here's what we know. Jesus doesn't invite us to the normal life. In fact, even in this story, he leans in in verse 40 as Martha was distracted with her serving and complaining, please tell my sister to help out. Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. There's one thing that is essential in this moment for Martha, in this moment for you and for me, Jesus simplifies things. Jesus lovingly and graciously calls out her name, Martha, Martha, because he knows Martha. He sees Martha. He loves Martha, just like he knows us and sees us and loves us. Martha, you're getting worked up over all of these things. You're worried and upset about all of these things, just like you and I are. We go day after day, crazy month after crazy month, Worried and upset and anxious and troubled and fussing. Every stain, every school project, every dirty sin, every surprise guest, every surge of responsibility then becomes a cause for us to get busy. And Jesus says one thing is necessary. One thing matters. One thing, Jesus says, is essential. It's almost as if Jesus... and in this moment with Martha is saying, Martha, your busyness isn't wrong. It's just not best. Because Martha isn't doing anything bad. She's just being pulled away from doing what's better. And I know, I know this. Hurry and this constant busy in our life is not just a threat to our emotional health. It's a threat to our spiritual lives as well. Because it has the potential, busy has the potential to kill everything that we hold dear. Our spirituality, our health, our marriage, our friends, our, our, our community, our thoughtful work, our creativity, our generosity, name your value. Hurry is a sociopathic predator on the loose in our society. As an aside, I'm, I'm never saying that, I'm not saying that you should never be busy that there shouldn't be moments in your life that you ought to have a little pep in your step. I'm, I'm not saying that you should drive slow in the left lane. Please, for the love of God. I'm not saying that busy shouldn't be part of your life. But what I am saying is hurry and love are incompatible. They just can't go together. In fact, all of my worst moments as a, as a dad, all of my worst moments as a husband, as a Pastor, as a human being, all of my worst moments come when I'm in a hurry. When I'm late for an appointment. When I'm behind on some unrealistic to-do list. When I'm trying to cram too much into my day. Hurry and love are, are incompatible. Even the writer of Hebrews knew this before the busyness of our, our lives today in 2024. The writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 4, chap, uh, chapter 4, verse 9. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. The writer of Hebrews in this moment is saying God rested in the Genesis account, he created everything, and then on day seven, God rested. But God didn't rest because he was tired. God doesn't get tired. No, God rested to show me and show you that rest is sacred, it's important, and that you need to get it. God rested. We ought to rest. Verse 11, the writer of Hebrews says, let us strive to enter that rest. A bit of irony here. Let us work. Let us toil. Let us push. Let us be challenged. Let us strive with everything that we are to enter this rest that God has for us so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. There's this connection in scripture between rest and obedience, between getting the sleep that we need and following Jesus the way that he calls us to. Some of you may know that I did my doctoral dissertation on 
uh, pastoral burnout and moral failure. And I'm here to tell you that most of the people that you now know who've fallen, you, you see it in the news, you see it in your news feed and social media, the, those pastors, those leaders that we trusted have this moral failure. But as I was doing my research uh, in my doctorate, what I found was that what caused the problems of immorality weren't just immoral things. It was actually a rest problem. That when leaders don't get the rest, when people don't get the rest that we need, sin begins to creep in in ways that we don't want. It wasn't a moral issue. It was a rest issue. They got exhausted and fatigued, and so they made decisions that never considered their family, never considered the congregation that they were a part of because they were just so tired. Listen, there are things in your life right now that you think you will fix by just working harder, by just doing more, by trying to overcome it. And actually what you need is not more work and not more busy. What you need is less. You need more rest and resting on the finished work of Jesus. Oh, if I can just squeeze in one more thing. If I can just close one more deal. If I can just get to one more social event and we cram our lives with as much as we possibly can, never finding the rhythm and the margin that allows us to slow down enough to hear from our heavenly father, stop. You don't have to sprint. You don't have to exhaust yourself. You don't have to burn out so that you can somehow measure up. Some of us take this busyness in our personal lives and and apply it to our spiritual life. We actually believe that if we're not busy doing for God, then God will forget about us, that God will not love us anymore. We, we at times believe we're not good enough, we're not smart enough, we believe that God will never use us unless we work harder, we achieve greater things, we perform better, we do more on the hamster wheel of life. Because if you aren't producing, then you aren't gonna be loved by God. Or if you're not celebrated, if you're not rewarded, then somehow God is not gonna be on your side. And so we just keep going. Got to be a better mother. Got to be a better father. We got to sign the kids up for one more activity. We got to take them to one more birthday party. We got to be better as an employee. We got to prove ourselves all the time. But can I just tell you, this does not lead to God loving you more. This leads to burnout, which is actually the opposite of what God wants for you. But we begin to believe this lie this lie from the enemy. But can we remind all of us, what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. This is the opposite of the gospel. The enemy tells us to perform and work until you're tired. The gospel tells us that Jesus already worked and Jesus already performed everything we would ever need. Jesus came to earth, he died on the cross, he accomplished and achieved to the point that he literally said, and I quote, it is finished for you, for me, which means we can't top it up. You can't add to what Jesus finished. There's nothing you can do to increase. Your work is to receive the work that was done for you. So friends, family, let's lay down this need to stay busy. Let's stop believing this lie that we've got to keep performing and keep trying and keep striving. Uh, Look at me. You do not have to be the perfect mom. You do not have to be the perfect dad. You don't have to be the perfect husband. You don't have to be the perfect wife. 
the perfect employee, the perfect student, the perfect teenager, the perfect whatever. We said it a couple of weeks ago, but because I'm stubborn, but because I forget when Jesus got baptized, his father, our heavenly father, looked down at Jesus and said, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. At this point, Jesus hadn't done anything. He hadn't performed a single miracle. He hadn't preached a single sermon. Jesus hadn't walked on water yet. He's done nothing and his father was pleased. And when your heavenly father looks at you, he sees Jesus. Which means if anybody tells you that you have to perform in order for Jesus to love you, if anybody tries to convince you that you've got work to do, you've got religious work to do, you've got alms to pay, you've got to get going, you've got to get busy, it is not the gospel. Can I go further? If there's someone in your life who's making you earn their love, work for their attention, get busy for their affection, it is not from God. Did you know that throughout the gospels, throughout the life and the work and ministry of Jesus. There were 30 times, 30, where Jesus just walked away. He didn't pick up the call. He didn't run to the emergency. I mean, somebody needs to hear that today. You think you always have to run to the emergency at work. I gotta gotta respond to that email right away. I I gotta answer that call. But can I just ask you, is is that more about you than it is the work expectations? Listen, there are times that Jesus just walked away from toxic people, from dangerous people, from dangerous situations. Literally in Matthew chapter 8, there was a huge crowd that had gathered just to see Jesus and be with Jesus. This is at the point where Jesus is building ministry, trying to create and capture momentum. And literally there's a huge crowd around them. And what does Jesus do? He commands them, Get, get away, go to the other side. What do you mean, Jesus? Like, they're ready to believe in you. What are you talking about? You're leaving in this moment. You need to have an altar call in this moment. No, Jesus says, I got a better idea. Let's go somewhere else. We need a break. In life, there are times where it's not about, what, life is not about what you're connected to that's important. It's about what you're disconnected from disconnecting so that we can reconnect to whatever breathes life and peace disconnecting from bad habits disconnecting from bad rhythms disconnecting from bad patterns disconnecting hello from bad people so that we can reconnect to the one who brings us health and life and passion Wayne Cordero says that the problem is we don't don't forget that we're Christians. We forget that we're human. And that one oversight can debilitate the potential of our future. Jesus comes to us. He looks at us and gives us this beautiful reality from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. When he says this in the message version that's on the screen, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, Jesus says, and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. This is the invitation of Jesus that we have today. And with this in mind, we ought to take an honest audit of our schedules and ask ourselves, are we weary? Are we exhausted? Are you fatigued? Are you frustrated? If things like gotten blown out of proportion in your life, here's what I want to suggest to you. If you're weary, if you're worn out, if you feel overextended and overexposed, if you're agitated, frustrated, easily annoyed, critical toward others, harboring gossip, resentment, blame shifting, envy, jealousy, strife, worry, anxiety. If you are right in the middle of busy in your life, what you need today is rest. I I know there are a lot of you today who 
looking at the week ahead, looking at the rest of the month, looking at the lead up to summer. I know there are a lot of you who have an enormous amount of work to do. Trying to save your business, trying to save your job, trying to save your marriage, save your children, save a friendship, save your reputation. So instinctively, our natural response is, I gotta get to work. I need to get busy, I need to work hard. And that may very well be true, but it's not fully and completely true. You don't just need to work, you need to worship. To set our attention, to reorder our lives around Jesus, to practice putting Jesus at the top of our priority list instead of our punch list. To practice just being still and being silent, inviting Jesus to call the shots in your life. Because here's the reality. Presence, pace, and connection are so much greater than distraction, rushing, and approval. Here's the thing. Being busy doesn't mean you're being faithful or fruitful as a Christian. It just means you're busy like everybody else. And you and I can have a new normal redefining the rhythms of our life. The antidote to hurry and busy isn't sloth and indifference. It's margin. It's rhythm. It's trust. Trust that we are finite, that God is infinite, and that he's good, and that he can do more in our rest than we can do in our work. And the good that will come from being delivered from hurry and busy isn't just pleasure. It's the ability to do calmly and effectively with strength and joy what matters most. If we want to learn how to keep going in our culture of busy, we've got to learn how to say no. Got to learn how to stop. Got to learn how to set boundaries in our life but we've got to remember the finished work of Jesus. You and I can rest because Jesus worked. Anytime we talk about what we need to do every day, we've got to make clear what Jesus has already done for us because that reshapes our identity to the point that we no longer need to work for approval. We've already gotten it because of what Jesus worked for us. For me, once I realize that I don't have to strive for approval from others, it allows me to slow down, to be present, to see my family, to see our kids, to say no and set boundaries. We talked about this just a couple of weeks ago. Maybe, maybe the boundary that you need to set is with your phone. Do you know that when you're in conversation with your kids, your grandkids, your family, they actually notice when you pick up your phone and look at it mid-conversation? Do you know that that actually communicates that, hey, this little device is more important than you are? So looking at your schedule, looking at your pace, it may actually look pretty regular. It may look normal, but Jesus doesn't want us to live the normal life. He invites us to a new normal, a a new normal of rest and rhythm and refreshing. And we, like Mary, can sit at the feet of Jesus and experience the freedom and the joy and the love that we can never experience by doing more. Let's pray. God, we're grateful that you don't require us to work and to earn. We're we're thankful that we don't have to top anything up or Uh, refuel any spiritual tank that what Jesus did and the work that he did on the cross accomplished everything to the place of completion. And so God, today, as we look at the busyness of our schedule, would you just give us the courage and the strength to lean into the rest that you have for us, to lean into a rhythm that creates space and creates margin for our lives so that we can slow down so that we can rest in the identity that you've given us. God, today, may we see us like Jesus sees us. May we slow down, may we stop. 
May we establish boundaries so that we can sit at your feet. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.